Get Smart, Lessons from the Artist. It's exactly a hundred years ago, 1917, and Marcel Duchamp pays the $6 submission fee for an upcoming exhibition hosted by the Society of Independent Artists in New York. Historians still can't definitively say this unconventional piece of art, a common porcelain urinal signed in black paint by R. Mutt and cheekily titled Fountain, was created by Duchamp himself or by, as he once mentioned, a friend with a pseudonym. But we do know it was a pivotal moment in the course of art history. It was, perhaps expectedly, rejected by the committee and placed in the back for safe hiding. Meanwhile, Duchamp hired a photographer to capture a now iconic photograph of the work, and when that photograph appeared in the magazine The Blind Man shortly thereafter, an anonymous editor highlighted its significance. He chose it, the caption claimed. Duchamp had given this mundane object a new point of view. He had, in fact, created new thought. That might have been a practical joke or a test of freedom of expression, but this self-christened ready-made challenged the very fabric of art and what it means to be an artist. It paved the way for the next century of artists and art movements, and indeed all of us, reminding us that we should question the way things are and reframe tradition. It's artists who tap into our humanity and stir us from our apathy and malaise. They cause us to think in ways we could never have imagined, sometimes because it's a stretch and often because it's rather uncomfortable. It's artists that lead us to innovation, for they can envision what could be and attempt to articulate that in poetic phrases, on the canvas or on film. There's a reason totalitarian governments seek to stamp out free-thinking artists, commonly filling the void with state-endorsed art. Thinking like an artist is dangerous, a threat to the status quo. And that's exactly why we should do it. Now, I don't know if it's because I dress a bit funky or because I'm always sketching, usually on my phone, but I often get asked by strangers, are you an artist? My go-to visceral response was, no way, I'm just a teacher. I'm just a teacher. Until I realized that being a teacher is precisely like being an artist and that perhaps like Marcel Duchamp, we should rethink our labels and embrace the artistry of being an educator, and in fact, a learner. I think we can get a lot of insight from studying the lives and creative processes of famous artists, and not just by their successes and iconic works, but by their jagged edges, their foibles, and the ways in which they worked. To get to thinking like an artist, we need to remember three big, conveniently alliterated for your memory's pleasure, concepts. Be porous, push past, and play. Now, if your immediate thought to being porous is sponge, you're right on target. I believe the essence of creativity is more about connecting dots, remixing and combining existing elements rather than inventing something totally novel, if there is such a thing. But to connect dots, one must have some dots. How do we grow our dot forest so that we may have source material to draw upon? By cultivating a sense of what I call wonderlust. Now we've all heard of wanderlust, but wanderlust is more about taking it all in, really looking rather than seeing, finding the wow in the now. Vincent McGall reminds us that we are surrounded by poetry on all sides and that most people do not admire enough. His environment became his muse and he tried to pin down the butterfly-like beauty and poignancy of the world around him. He said, I see paintings and drawings in the poorest cottages and in the dirtiest corners. Pop artist Andy Warhol, too, was awed by the ordinary. He gave new context to the kinds of things we have lying around in our pantries like Brillo pads and soup cans. He suggested you need to let the little things that would ordinarily bore you suddenly thrill you. And sometimes what's around us is not that pretty, but it can be nonetheless moving, and we must find the beauty in the broken. Perhaps no artist exemplifies this more than Frida Kahlo, whose childhood polio and severe injury from a trolley accident caused her great physical damage and suffering. Her paintings and sketches were brutally honest self-portraits of her perceived flaws of mind and body. Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec, too, had similar afflictions, and being bedridden as a child actually got him into drawing. But I love how he's attracted to the broken of society, the people of the Parisian night, for example, and by telling their story with his sketches, empowered rather than exploited them. This reminds me of a Japanese ascetic called wabi-sabi, the beauty of the imperfect and impermanent. And one of the arts derived from this is kintsukuroi, repairing cracks in pottery with gold to accentuate their history, their scars, rather than disguising it. 
If we can, like Michelangelo described, see the angel in the marble and carve to set it free, we can recognize and reveal the potential in ourselves and others, especially those that need the most love and feel the most broken. And while fragility can and should be appreciated, thinking like an artist also means having the confidence to live your truth. I was fortunate to recently visit Frida Kahlo's personal residence, the Blue House in Mexico City, and was struck by a special exhibit about her wardrobe. She cultivated her own signature style based on her Mexican heritage. She knew where she was from and she owned it. Her distinct flowy skirts and flower crowns and layers of jewelry became her trademark. Some even critiqued her for being a walking circus. But what was most fascinating was her self-painted corsets and body casts, how she used these as canvases to display her passionate beliefs in communism. Pablo Picasso, too, understood the power of using the platform you're given to stand for something. He was supposed to create a piece for the 1937 World's Fair, something extolling new technology, but was so distraught upon reading accounts of General Franco's Nazi-aided attack on a northern Spanish bass town, he abandoned his original plan and went on to create a masterpiece of a mural vividly depicting the horrors of modern war, Guernica. At that time, he declared, painting is not done to decorate apartments. It is an instrument of war. Picasso knew that the job of art is to spark questions rather than provide answers. But more than that, he lived in the why not. Others have seen what is and asked why. I have seen what could be and asked why not. Living in the question, imagining the what could be's and the why not's is difficult. In fact, it's sometimes downright uncomfortable. The poet Keats called this negative capability, being okay with the uncertain. It's questioning that leads to truth. So why don't we have wonder walls in high school classrooms, not just in kindergarten ones? Why don't we keep notebooks full of our own personal queries and make our thinking visible like Leonardo da Vinci did? Cultivating curiosity necessitates embracing ambiguity. And we should be curious outwardly too, which is why we need to procure a posse. The Impressionist artists were really good at this. They ate, drank, hung out, made art together, even sleeping on each other's floors. They knew that the best creativity is combinatorial. It comes from the mixing of people and the intermingling of ideas. Picasso famously surrounded himself with a constellation of creative folk, finding a bit of a muse in everyone, taking what he needed from them, and then refashioning it into something else. As important as it is to develop a trusted network of minds, I call them creative soulmates, it's also worthwhile to break your bubble. After the opening of Japan in 1853 from years of isolation, the Impressionist artists in Europe immersed themselves in this unfamiliar aesthetic, adopting and remixing ideas from Japanese art. It's the same thing we can do today by being globally connected. Not just being connected, but really pursuing those connections outside of our comfort bubbles of like-minded friends. Seeking out and embracing others' perspectives. Considering them with respect, even though we might not agree with them. This all helps us to push past. Thinking like an artist means pushing past. Personal and mental pain, to be sure. Obstacles the world throws at us. And of course, the proverbial status quo. First off, artists rarely seek permission. The best of them create their own movements. In fact, one of my adopted mantras from Warhol is, you have to do the stuff that average people don't understand because those are the only good things. And boy, did people fail to understand Impressionism. This was Monet's first official rejection. And for some reason, it's one of my favorites of his works. In the 1800s, the Académie de Beaux-Arts dominated the French art scene. And this almost abstract depiction of fishing boats was rejected by the jury of the Salon de Paris, the annual exhibition. But Monet, Renoir, Pizarro and Degas, among others, created a co-op of independent artists so they could display their progressive work freely. It was a snarky critic that gave the soon-to-be revolutionary art movement its name, Impressionism, exclaiming that wallpaper in its embryonic state was more finished than Monet's self-titled Impression Sunrise. Instead of recoiling in embarrassment, the Impressionists embraced this intentionally derogatory title. They owned it, flaunted it, perhaps even allowing it to inspire them. In spite of everything, you have to be you and not play into society's expectations just because. As Vincent van Gogh mused, normality is a paved road. It's comfortable to walk upon, but no flowers grow on it. And sometimes you have to channel the bad to the rad. 
like Leonardo da Vinci. Da Vinci was a bastard. Actually, he was supposedly quite charming and refined, but I mean he was born into that unfortunate circumstance of his father not marrying his mother. And back in the Renaissance, that meant you couldn't get formal schooling. Despite this, the young Leonardo rose above his roots. He moved on and up, even dying in the palace of the French king as resident genius. What a great job title that is. This is precisely why he was so interested in autodidactic, inquiry-based learning and experimentation. He valued his innate curiosity over canon. He held personal experience and experiments in greater esteem than the established academic tradition. This rebellious attitude is one that begat so many of his innovations, and it's a character trait we should seek to nurture in ourselves and the young people in our charge. A few years ago, some Harvard professors conducted research around a creative stereotype effect. That is, if you imagine it, it will be. They found that people who imagined themselves to be eccentric poets performed much more creatively, thought more divergently, than those who identified themselves as rigid librarians. Although, to be honest, I've never known a a librarian that's rigid. They're all fab. Because sometimes, as you know, we have to stop the pout and psych ourselves out. One artist who demonstrated that was Michelangelo. He always fancied himself more of a sculptor than a painter. Of course, it didn't help that rival da Vinci said his bodies looked like they were stuffed with walnuts. When the Pope offered him the Sistine Chapel commission, he thought, ugh, I've lost my dream job of sculpting a tomb for the next 20 years, and now I'm faced with this logistical nightmare of a fresco, something I'm not adept at. But he decided to fail flamboyantly, as punk godfather Malcolm McLaren would put it. Sure, he was an amateur, but he wasn't going to let anyone be able to question his ambition. He worked beyond his will. And sometimes we have to do that. And like Michelangelo, who engineered his own scaffolding apparatus and succeeded in creating one of the most recognizable and breathtaking artworks in history, the creative constraints work to our benefit if we would only embrace them. Sometimes, the way out of the box is via the shackles. Limitations can be physical. Maybe we don't have enough resources or time at our disposal. Then think of Toulouse-Lautrec drawing on cardboard scraps, a sort of making the best of it with bricolage. Often, we're plagued with mental or physical ailments. I think of bedridden Henri Matisse scribbling on his walls with an elongated brush or developing paper cutouts, drawing with scissors, a solution to his limited range of movement. And I think of Edvard Munch using creativity as catharsis, trying to capture the angst of the age as well as his personal suffering in his expressionist works like The Scream. How can we squeeze out potential from pain? Perhaps by finding strength in a smile. As da Vinci said, I love those who can smile in trouble, who can gather strength from distress and grow brave by reflection. It's important to marvel at the mistakes because, as Andy Warhol so cleverly stated, when you do something exactly wrong, you always turn up something. And this leads us to the last of the big three takeaways from the artists, the practice of play. Play can be frivolous, sure, but it doesn't need to be only that. In fact, it's how we learn. But first, we might need to unlearn. At last, I don't know how to draw, Toulouse-Lautrec phrased it best later in his life. My favorite story of unlearning is Picasso's now famous bull abstraction. Rumor has it the study in simplification of getting to the bullness of the bull was used with Apple designers to influence their thinking. For Picasso, destruction and subtraction was sublime. If I paint a wild horse, you might not see the horse, but surely you will see the wildness. How do we find and communicate the essence of something? In order to move forward like Picasso did with cubism, We have to be able to play with convention, perhaps even to dance on the edge of the expected. Michelangelo was notorious for thinking differently. He wasn't called the divine one for nothing. He took on the challenge of a 14-foot block of marble no one would touch for 20 years, and he thought to depict the biblical David as a full-grown man rather than an adolescent boy, which had been the convention. But he played with a purpose. His daring was grounded in hard work. He knew there was no genius fairy and that mastery comes with muscle. He lamented that if people knew how hard he had to work, his talent would not seem so wonderful. His attributed motto was Ancora in Baro, or I'm still learning. 
It's a powerful reminder to us all as we strive to be lifelong learners, and I encourage everyone to be transparent about that so that children can see that the love of learning doesn't have to cease after university. And go warned, do not quench your inspiration and your imagination. Do not become the slave of your model. And we shouldn't be a slave to our present selves either. In fact, I like to think we should make like Madonna, change it up, reinvent ourselves to adapt to new times or challenges, avoid being one-trick ponies. Pablo Picasso was really good at this. He reimagined himself with different periods, like the blue and the rose. We need to constantly look at our practice, reflect on it, explore new paths, play with different mediums, adopt and incorporate fresh influences. And one of the best ways to do that is to tinker with new technologies. I've worked quite a bit in ed tech in in helping teachers integrate various digital technologies into their pedagogy. I'm fascinated by the creative potential of this little multimedia studio in our pockets. But it struck me a while ago that this handheld device is very much like this handheld device. And even more so like this unassuming piece of tech. Yes, it's a metal paint tube. You see, the metal paint tube was revolutionary in that it freed artists from the confines of the studio. It broke the four walls so that artists, most specifically the Impressionists of the late 19th century, could do their work en plein air, capturing the fleeting moments and subtle changes in light. It revolutionized what art was, as did the advent of photography around the same time. But Impressionist artists didn't shy away from these novelties. They played with them, pushing the boundaries of what they could do. Photography could have put them out of a job, but instead of freaking out, they rethought, reimagined what their profession could be. And I think with the swift approach of AR, VR, AI, and the internet of things, not to mention the exponentially advancing tech we've got right now, we need to think like artists more than ever. For in play, there is power. We can leverage the technologies for our creativity, just as our predecessors did with film, the printing press, or the quill. I like to follow Vincent van Gogh's advice and try to make something good every day. And then by all means, share your creations. My mother was a fan of baking cookies, and much to my chagrin, she she liked to give them all away to neighbors. She told me, what's the point of making something if you're not going to share it? Little did I know she was schooling me in Picasso theory. The meaning of life is to find your gift. The purpose of life is to give it away. Because... Whatever you do, whatever field you're in, whether you use a camera or a computer, work in a classroom or a corporate office, the world is your studio. Think like an artist. Be porous. Push past. And play. Definitely play. Imagine. And see today what others won't understand until tomorrow.